You're listening to Shaping Opinion, a production of O'Brien Communications. O'Brien Communications is a corporate communications consultancy that can be found at O'BrienCommunications.com. To connect with us at Shaping Opinion, go to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. If you enjoy the podcast, please rate and review it on Apple Podcasts. When you rate and review on iTunes, you help more listeners like you find us. If you were to take someone who's never been to Gettysburg before, what particular location would you take them to? It's kind of a loaded question. Usually when I take them, we go on a whole battlefield tour. I, I, I think that if it's someone who's never been there, you have to give them the breathtaking view. That would probably be a little round top because of the expansiveness of the valley that you see. You really get a, a, a picturesque view of, of Gettysburg and what was once a very bloody battlefield. I guess the second, if there was a tie, it would be at the angle, which was where the Union Army repelled Pickett's charge, because that's the question that everybody has. Where did that happen? So I think those two, probably a little round top one and, and the angle would be two. But there, are, there, were, there would be many tied for three. Well, you've probably done that before. What are people's reactions when you take them to those places? Little Round Top, the view is breathtaking. I mean, they're not expecting that if they've never been to uh, to Gettysburg or, or 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 that part of the state. It's just you know the the rolling hills with the mountains in the background, and you. I think when you're up there, you can somewhat, from a 21st century perspective, get a sense of what it might have looked like. Because that's, I mean, that's what I do. I think that's what people do. Trying to place yourself back. You're standing on the ground exactly where it happened and what that must have looked like on July 2nd or July 3rd, 1863. I think that's what people kind of go through. And our perceptions are probably all wrong. It probably didn't look like that, but it, at least it, it transports you back into time. So it, it gets you into the into the mode. I'm Tim O'Brien. In this episode of the Shaping Opinion podcast, we're joined by Tom McMillan. He's the author of several history books, among them Gettysburg Rebels, the story of five native sons who went home to fight for the Confederacy. The premise of our podcast is simple. We talk about people, events, and things that have shaped the way we think. Today we're going to talk with Tom about the Civil War history of Gettysburg and why it still matters. The American Civil War started in 1861, with the southern states deciding to form the Confederacy and secede from the United States. The Confederacy won its share of battles, as the Union seemed to struggle with strategy, decision-making, and leadership. By the summer of 1863, Confederate General Robert E. Lee decided to capitalize on a series of Confederate victories and try to win the war on northern soil. His goal was to force President Lincoln to negotiate for a quick peace. His route was the Shenandoah Valley, which provided cover for his army as the Union Army followed in pursuit. The Confederate force entered Pennsylvania in mid-June, and by the end of the month it had reached the Susquehanna River near Harrisburg. Federal and Confederate forces would collide at the town of Gettysburg on the morning of July 1st. On that first day, the Confederate forces pushed the Union troops out of the town, but they could not take some strategic hills that preserved the high ground for the Federals. On the second day, reinforcements arrived for both armies. General Lee decided to attack the growing Union army, which occupied strong positions in the heights. He paid particular attention to the right and left sides of the Federals trying to outflank them. But the day ended with no significant change in ground occupation. On the third day, which was July 3rd, the Confederates attacked the Union Center at a place known as Cemetery Ridge. This is known as Pickett's Charge, named after Confederate General George Pickett, who led the attack. On that day, the Confederates would reach their furthest point north during the war. Historians would refer to this as when the Confederates reached high tide before retreating south. The Battle of Gettysburg was a defeat for Lee and the Confederate Army. 
but it would be two more years of fighting before the Civil War would come to an end. By the end of the Battle of Gettysburg, there were heavy casualties on both sides. Roughly 51,000 soldiers were killed, wounded, captured, or listed as missing. In my own research on the topic, one person described it best. He said, that's 51,000 unique stories combined with the stories of those who survived or were affected in some way by the Battle of Gettysburg. The fighting at Gettysburg has inspired countless movies, books, documentaries, and many journal and news articles. The town of Gettysburg remains one of the most popular Civil War destinations for historians, history buffs, and tourists. So what's the appeal? Why does Gettysburg still matter? Today we talk with author Tom McMillan about this question and much more. Tom, would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself and how you started learning about Gettysburg? For the last 23 years, I've been Vice President of Communications for the Pittsburgh Penguins. Before that, I was in the, the Pittsburgh sports media for 18 years, so my entire background has been media slash journalism slash PR, almost all of it in the realm of sports. I grew up in Bellevue. Here went to Bellevue High School uh, and went to Point Park for a journalism degree. And that's uh, all in Pittsburgh. Yes, everything's in Pittsburgh. And, and so I kind of just, yeah, you know, always, this was always the, the, the central part of my life. But, you know, you take those tests in high school where they, you, they try to figure out what you should be. And number one was journalist. Number two was history teacher. So it was really close. I was debating whether I should have been a history teacher. Uh, I obviously had a, had a very fun and rewarding uh, career in, in media and PR, but the study of history is still available to you. So I've been, I, I've been a, an amateur historian most of my life. Um, with Gettysburg, I think like most people who grew up in Pennsylvania, I went there with my parents when I was a little kid. I remember that, and it made an impression, but then you get on with the rest of your life. And I, I share this story with a lot of people who I meet up there now, and, and it's it's very similar. Uh, then s at some point later in life, when you're an adult, you, you regain the enthusiasm. For me, that was the release of the movie Gettysburg in 1993. I remember um, seeing a piece on A&E one night about the making of the movie Gettysburg. I just stumbled across it, and I thought, oh, this would be interesting. I'd like to see this when it comes out. It did come out. Uh, not many theaters showed it uh, around here because it was a four-and-a-half-hour movie, and I said, I've got to go. It went on a Tuesday night. It was actually one of those movies that was in two parts. They had an intermission. I was so mesmerized that I got in my car on Friday and drove to Gettysburg uh, when I was driving a, a, along one of the one of the roads that sits up the monuments for Pickett's Charge. It hit me, and I've had the sickness ever since. It has never gone away, and it's uh, it's it's in many ways uh, my escape. That's why you're so fascinated with it. But why do you think other people, when they see the movie or they read books or or they even study it in history or take a field trip, what is it about Gettysburg that has a certain number of people coming back? Yeah, I, I think when you study it, even if you just study it a little bit, you understand the importance it had in the history of the country. It was a turning point in the history of the country. And I always tell people to imagine uh, when I'm doing my little tours, what the world would be like today, what the country would be like today if the Union Army had lost at Gettysburg. We can only guess, we can only extrapolate, but it would have, something different would have, would have happened. So I think you feel that. To me, though, it's um, with people who, who love the Civil War and love these battlefields, it's access. We can get there. I would love to be able to go to Normandy Beach once a month. I would love to be able to, to go to Pearl Harbor once a month or Iwo Jima or all these great places, you know, some of the battlefields of Europe. I would love them all, been to some of them, uh, bucket list for more. But the Civil War battlefields, and especially Gettysburg for people in Pennsylvania or the Northeast, you can get there. You can drive there. It's, it, there's easy access. And then for those of us who, who do fall in love with it, it's because you're walking on ground where something famous happened. You can feel it. I feel that. There are friends of mine I've taken it there who obviously don't feel that. They don't get that sense. They say, how can you keep going up there? Haven't you been there? Do you just read the monuments? 
And to them, you know, they have other interests, and it did, didn't hit. But to me, that's all. It, it, I love to go to historic places anywhere, whether it's Jamestown or wherever you can imagine, because something important happened there, and you, you can transport yourself back in the time. And Gettysburg is so – because the Union Army won, and they realized right away this was going to be an important place in history, and they, they protected it and monumented it, if that's a word. You can go back and really study the battle and feel that sense. So I, th- I think that's what people feel. One of the things you just mentioned I thought was pretty interesting because that's a lot of people, they say, do you just look at the monuments? Well, obviously, because the monuments are there, that's what you see. What do you see behind the monuments, around the monuments? What, what are the things that you see? Well, again, I, I think for a lot of people, and I still do this, I did this at the beginning when I didn't know very much, you visualize of what it must, what it must have looked like when the Union side, you're thinking there were Confederate soldiers coming up this hill. I'm trying to think what that looks like. You know, on the Confederate side, you're thinking there are Union soldiers over there. So I, I think you can do that because you know it, something like that did happen there. The more you study, though, and understand the ground and you read the soldiers' accounts and all of a sudden see so you're going to look for this little knoll or this little valley that somebody wrote about in 1863, he remembered being there. And so I do a lot of that now. I mean, you know, I think once you get into it to the, to the level that, that I'm into it, you're going to the off-the-beaten-path places, the places that not many people go to, and see if you can find those little clues. It's fascinating. My mother, who's who's long gone, used to always say, haven't you seen everything? And the answer, I always say, no, there, you know, there were 160,000 soldiers who fought here. There are 160,000 stories, but you can never know everything. And the other thing, Tim, I think it's, it's what gets me about this, and this, this affects a lot of parts of history, though, it, some of it will always be a mystery because a lot of the truth, a lot of the stories died with the guys who died on that battlefield. They all had stories, too. One of them, or many of them, I'm sure, would have had a clue. They would be able to give us a clue as to what really happened on this part of the battle. But because they died, they weren't able to tell their stories. So we only, even as much as it's been studied and as many monuments as are, there are, as many accounts have been written, we only will always have part of the story because a lot of it is just, you know, it, it ended on July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd when, when those guys died. Well, you reminded me when you were talking about when people see the monuments and what you see when you're there. And I thought back to when I took one of my kids, my older son, there. and He was five years old, and and he liked the idea of wearing the the cap and walking around with a toy sword or a toy gun. But I remember this trip in particular because we actually took out of the library a Time Life book, and it was nothing but photographs. It was a history book of Gettysburg and the Civil War. So I I put post-it notes on all the photos from Gettysburg, and we went to each place where the photo was, and I held the book out, and my son looked at the picture and then the location, and it all registered with a five-year-old. And he's still, he's, he's far older than five now, but he's still into it. But I wanted to talk today about something that's a little bit more relatable. And you mentioned there were 161,000 stories, and we don't have time for that today, but you wrote a book, and the book that you wrote was called Gettysburg Rebels, the story of five Native sons who went home to fight for the Confederacy. So you focused on five people, five of those stories, and I thought that was a nice approach because those are five rich stories, and you spent a whole book on it. Why did you write the book? I always wanted to write a book on Gettysburg. I wasn't sure that that opportunity would ever arise. I wasn't ever sure I would ever write a book on history. As it turned out in 2014, I ended up writing a book about Flight 93, the September 11th flight that, that crashed in Somerset County. Uh, it was received very well. It was a very rewarding, emotional experience for me. I got to meet those family members. But most importantly for me, it proved to me that I could do it and it established that even though my entire background was in sports, that I could write a book on history and it could be well received. But even with that I wasn't – there's so many – you know, there are 60,000 books written on the Civil War, and probably a quarter of those are on Gettysburg. I wasn't someone who wanted to rewrite one of the stories, and that happens a lot. There are, you know, there are 50 books on Pickett's Charge, Uh, and there are different takes. I I, I read them. It's interesting to get the different takes. I love the research part. I wouldn't have been fascinated by that. So I didn't think I would ever find a topic that – that would lead me into doing this kind of research. And I kicked around, you know, I knew as, as we want to, maybe want to talk about some of the individuals, there were, there were two guys who I knew of who grew up in Gettysburg 
who fought in the Confederate Army at the Battle of Gettysburg. And I thought, how fascinating, not even because it's the Civil War, in any war, imagine circumstances happening that you come back as a foreign invader in your hometown, what that would have felt like, what the implications of that would be. So I decided to look into it. I figured there wasn't a lot there or somebody else would have written that book already. And, and I really had to dig. I found out actually there were five. There were five young men who grew up in Gettysburg. They moved to what is now West Virginia, what was then Virginia for work in the mid 1850s. They joined militia units. As you know, Tim, the militia units on both sides became the foundations of those armies, and they ended up fighting in the Confederate Army. But even with that, I, I, they never would have imagined they'd been going back to their old hometown. Uh, the frustrating part was these guys didn't write much. It wasn't like writing. Most books are about generals and battlefield heroes. There's a lot of material. These guys didn't leave a lot. I really had to dig through and tra- uh, you know, track down ancestors and, and things like that. But I still thought it was, it was worth telling that story of, uh, again, foreign invaders in their old hometown in this most famous battle of a hugely significant part in a, of American history. But also, as, as, as you indicated, from the real foot soldier, four of these guys never rose above the rank of private. One made it all the way to sergeant. These were just regular guys. So it was a little bit of that experience too. I wish I could have gathered more information, but I, I was happy with what I was able to gather, and uh, it, it leads to some fascinating uh, book talks when I go around to Civil War roundtables or whatever. Well, here we are in the 21st century, and we're talking about five stories that may have been lost to history if you didn't write that book. Let's talk about some of those stories, because I, I know that one of the more famous ones that you mentioned is Wesley Culp. One of the big parts of the battlefield was the Culp Farm. Could we talk a little bit about Wesley Culp and his story? Yeah, it's, and that, that was the one that really got me going because that's been out there a little bit, largely because the Culp farm was there. Culp's Hill is one of the, uh, the iconic places on that battlefield. And you, you'd go through Gettysburg, and there be, might be a little thing in the museum where you'd say, and there was a guy from Gettysburg who fought for the Confederate Army, and he died on his uncle's farm which tugs at the heartstrings. Now, again, no matter what kind of war it is, no matter what army it is, and his brother William was in the Union Army, and yet no one ever really dug into it. So that was when I was trying to figure out if there was enough information. There was more on him than any of the others I really dug into. But I'm a, as, a, as a, an old journalist, I'm a skeptic at heart. I was thinking some of this myth can't be true. I found out that it wasn't basically the, the, the basic story was true. Um, he did not die on Culp's Hill. Culp's Hill was not owned by his uncle. It was a much more distant relative. These things, people start telling the stories, and they keep, you know how it is. They keep getting repeated and repeated, and, and they become facts. So I wanted to set the story straight a little bit. But the one thing that happened, or the, probably the most amazing thing as I was doing the research, I tracked down a descendant. who I found the name in a book of a guy who had some Wesley Culp letters. And I looked him up on the internet, and he had passed away, but I found his obituary, and his two adult sons were living near Harrisburg. So I cold wrote them letters. Hey, I'm just, you know, I realize you may throw this letter away, but I'm doing a book. I tried to establish it. And uh, two days later, one of them sent me a text. Wow. And, and, and we got on the phone, and he said, my dad was the historian genealogist. I know we're related to the Culps. I don't have a lot of knowledge myself. I saved my dad's things, you can have them or you can look at them. So I figured he would, I was excited, I figured he'd let me drive to Harrisburg one day and put on white gloves and look through these these little envelopes and touch these letters that were written in the 1860s. Two days later, he sends me another text, Tom, I just put them in the mail. He, t- he took documents from the 1860s, handwritten by someone who has a Civil War pedigree, uh, and and mailed them to me. And it was, well, he oh. trusts the U.S. Postal Service, yeah, yeah. I guess. <laughs> well, I think what happens... It's changed. Now he realized what he had. He he wasn't into it like his father was. He didn't, you know, and that's why we've lost a lot of things. The things are in boxes. We all move. We need to downsize. I'm going to throw this crap away from my great-great-grandfather, and we lose a lot of things. And I think if I hadn't done this project by Cork of Fate and tracked him down, that probably would have happened there. But he sent them to me, and I can tell you, as, as, a, as a history buff, you would probably feel the same. My hands were trembling as you're holding something but written by this guy, Wesley Culp, to his sister in 1860. 
What he didn't know was there, there was also a six-page handwritten story of Wesley Culp. I put my fingers up for quote marks. Uh, written by Wesley's niece in the early 1930s about Wesley's story in the Battle of Gettysburg. No historian had ever seen it. It had never been referenced. It had never gotten out of this envelope. So that really was was a huge find for me because it corrected some of the myths, just maybe adjusted some of the myths. This stuff was generally true, but it, it really got to the bottom of the story. And I, ironically, I met him and his daughter and his grandson at Gettysburg last year. So three generations of Culps were going to tour Culps Hill, and they're now all engaged in it because they realize what they have. But again, I think those things would have lost. So just to, to find that out, and the crux of that story was when Wesley Culp came back, I mean, he, his unit, we know, marched right through town on July 1st, the battle being July 1st, 2nd, What, and 3rd. what unit was he a part of? He was in the 2nd Virginia Infantry. And the Stonewall Brigade, which is the most famous brigade in the Confederate Army, and and they they uh, bedded down for the night. They weren't going to be in action that day. And in the dark, he 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 his sister lived in town. He walked into town and rapped on his sister's door, in the middle of the Civil War. I mean, Gettysburg was a Union town. It was held by the Confederates, but it was still very dangerous. Imagine the sisters. They haven't seen their brother for two years. There's a knock at the door. There's been a war. A war has come to your doorstep, and now there's a knock on the door. You look out, and there's a guy in a Confederate uniform, yeah, sure. and it's your brother. And, uh, and they tried to get him to stay. Uh, he didn't stay. He had to go back to his unit. He said, I'll be back. I have some messages for people. I'll be back the next day. And he was, he was killed the next morning on a, on a skirmish line. Uh, much earlier than history had previously recorded it. But this, handwritten by his niece, whose mother was the lady who answered the door, so she heard it directly from the lady. It's as close as we can get to direct evidence. Talking about that conversation she had her with her Confederate soldier brother in that house that night. And then he was killed the next day. They went out looking for the body. So the, digging into those, those kinds of things, it's, it, it's what keeps you going. You find those little clues in places you didn't expect them, so you... If, if there's real satisfaction, it's adding a little layer to history that people didn't know before. Well, Wesley Colt may have been the most famous hometown soldier to come back as part of the Confederacy. There was another one that you found and you uh, described in your book. His name is Henry Wentz. He, he was the second guy that got me going that I was really intrigued about because for anybody who's gone to Gettysburg and gone down the Emmitsburg Road right to the Peach Orchard, which is one of the most visited parts of the battlefield, right across the road there is this odd iron tablet that says simply, Wentz House. And there is nothing there. Obviously, you know, there used to be a house there, but there's nothing there. So literally no one ever goes to that side of the field because this is somewhat, everybody walks on the other side of the Peach Orchard. And then you do some reading and you realize not only was Henry Wentz who grew up in that house in the Confederate Army, and not only was he at Gettysburg, but he was in an artillery unit that was posted 600 yards from the house, pointed at the house, at Union troops that were stationed around that house at a key part of the battlefield. His parents still lived there. His sister still lived there. Now, his mother and sister had been moved out of town for the battle. His dad was in the house. He wouldn't have known this. And Henry never wrote anything. He really, I really had to dig for him. He just kind of went through life and didn't leave many records, never got married, never owned property, or never owned a home. He lived out the rest of his life in Martinsburg, West Virginia. But to think of what must have been going through his head, how I wish he had written a diary of pointing your cannon at the house where you grew up, where your father might be in it. And then they charged that day. The Confederates made some inroads on July 2nd. He basically ended up charging with his cannons through the front yard of the house where he grew up. And he passed it, and that night as it fell dark, curiosity got the best of him. He went into the house, and uh, he found his father there. And a, a, a descendant who was really into history just wrote a snippet about their conversation, how I wish I would have known what they talked about. But he went in to see his father. They had a discussion, and he went back to the Confederate Army and fought again the next day. They were part of the artillery, artillery bombardment of Pickett's Charge. We know he came back to Gettysburg at least once. The remainder of these five guys, only one that I could find, came back ever after the war. Henry came back because... 
He settled his parents' estate. After both parents died, he came back to – there are signatures of his documents in the Adams County Historical Society in 1872, nine years after the Civil War. I wonder what happened then with interaction with the citizens in, in town who would have known that he was in the battle. So, you know, you don't have that part of the story, so there's a, there's a little bit of the theater of the mind. But I think that's valuable, too. I wrote as much as I could find out and then let people's imaginations run wild. But just a fascinating story, to come, not just to come back. You know, you know, the premise of the book is these guys who came back as foreign invaders. But this guy was firing on the house where he grew up. And the thing that really got to me that I realized about halfway through the research, and we'll get into the other guys, but there's no indication that Robert E. Lee or his senior staff had any idea they had five guys who grew up in Gettysburg in the Army, which is completely astounding from a military intelligence standpoint. And we know that the Confederates got lost at least twice. They didn't have their cavalry there. What if they'd been able to grab a guy from Gettysburg who grew up there who— Whatever these guys clearly weren't great soldiers. They only, like as I mentioned, only four of them. Four of them never rose above the rank of private. But whatever else they could or could not have done, they would not have gotten lost. Would that have changed things? I don't know. We can always. I don't know. But they wouldn't have gotten lost. So it's an incredible lack of communication for those who do what you and I do for a living, of how that could happen. It just stuns me that even in just conversations in the troops. Hey, sir. Hey, Colonel. There's a guy from Gettysburg in our in our unit, and there's no record anywhere that that was ever passed up the line. It got the Gettys uh, Wesley Culp's brigade commander knew, because he had to give him a pass to go into town to visit his sister. Yet that brigade commander never thought to pass that up the line. For those of us who uh, my ancestors fought in the Union Army, I'm glad that happened because I wanted the Union Army to win the battle, uh, which which they did. But it's just another factoid where, you, you know, history is so much of a what if, but this is a real what if. It's not a made up what if. It's they were there and their senior commanders didn't know they were there. They, they, they could have had that kind of influence. So I, I, you, you, going back in history, I wish I could sit these guys down and ask them about them. Well, you said that the, uh, that, that the Confederates got lost twice in this battle, but also, and I knew that even from everything that you read, that, that the generals on the Confederate side knew that this was a big battle for terrain. So if you had local people in your own army that knew this terrain, because it was so unusual, they they knew at the time that would have been an advantage. So there's no doubt that they didn't know their, that they had Gettysburg. And they did it a lot in the South. Most of the war was fought in the South, but there were, there were many, many accounts in the Confederate Army of if you were near Fredericksburg or Richmond or whatever, and there was a local man in the Army, for that brief period of time, he was taken temporarily out of the ranks and assigned to staff as a scout or guide. Many of the great generals did that. We know that happened all the time. They real even in just just be, you're from Georgia, you don't know roads in Virginia. You know you need a local man to do that. Uh, and, and why that wouldn't have happened? Clearly, the Union Army had those advantages here. They were they were not only did they had the help of the townspeople who were very much for them, but they also had people from Gettysburg in the army. So they had that. They knew where they were going. They knew the hills. They knew the valleys. They knew the creeks. They knew where, where everything was. And those things. They're very important to the military today. They're even more important back then when you didn't have the kind of communications that you have today. You really had to lay out those plans in advance so that hopefully you would not be surprised. So that's an element that, that didn't happen because they, they didn't know these guys were, were in the Army. Again, it was, it was maybe the most astounded I was from doing this research in the book that that, that was never passed along. Well, we had two people so far, and both of them had the chance to see family while they were in Gettysburg for that brief period of time. The three other people that you wrote about in your book were all brothers, the Hoffman brothers. Could you talk about the Hoffman brothers? And I knew nothing about them, and only two of them have been mentioned even briefly, and one was never known. Nothing was really known about these guys. But I had to research why Wesley Culp moves moves moved to Virginia as a 16 year old I, I did I didn't know that Henry once was a little older he went for work he would aspirations of opening a carriage company so that that kind of made sense but Wesley 16 what funny he went because his employer a carriage maker Garrett Gettysburg was a big carriage town CW Hoffman moved his business from Gettysburg to Shepherdstown in 1856 
So you're five years before the war. Yeah, these guys all, they, they went in. The question I asked is because some people infer that these guys, the war broke out and they went to fight for the Confederates. No, they, they had actually moved to Virginia for work, had nothing to do with uh, sectional problems. They were working there. It wasn't that far. It was only about 50 miles from Gettysburg, but that was a lot longer, that farther than, than, it, than it is now. And, and so he, he moved his business there and he invited Wesley to come. And like a lot of 16 year olds, he said, why not? I'll take the adventure. I did notice by looking in, uh, you can find a lot, if you've ever done a genealogy, you can find a lot of information in census reports. So I looked up C.W. Hoffman in the census in Gettysburg in, in 1850, and he had three young sons, who if you added 10 years to their age, would have been of the age to be Civil War soldiers. So I went to the National Archives, and sure enough, Robert Frank and Wesley Hoffman, all born in Gettysburg, all who grew up two blocks from the town square, were not only in the Confederate Army, but were parts of units that came north with Lee in the summer of 1863. So all of a sudden, that went, went from two to five, and I thought, wow, this is more impactful than I thought. And, and so it, it, it gave me more places to research. And there was a little more about the Hoffman family, per se. So I was able to piece a little bit of that together. So basically, Wesley would have been friends with the, with the three Hoffman brothers. He would have known them from their time in Gettysburg. They might have known Henry once. He was a little older, but, but four of these guys you know, knew each other well. And, and, and one of the things that happened to, all, well, to Wesley and the oldest, Robert Hoffman and Henry Wentz, when they went, they did what young men did all, all across the country at that point. They joined militia units. You know, that has a, uh, a negative connotation today. Uh, it, back then, every town had at least one, if not more. That, it, it was very important uh, for young men. Uh, it was a, not only did they get to put on a uniform and, and uh, get a gun and do drills and pretend you're defending your hometown, but, but it was a great social outlet. You know, that's you know, pre-smartphones and internet. Uh, that's how you would, especially for somebody moving into a town, you could meet new friends and hang out with your buddies, and, and, and that's what happens. And, and again, these militia units often enlisted en masse in the Army. So my, uh, my relatives from the South Hills of Pittsburgh were in the St. Clair Guards. That was their militia unit. They became Company H of the 62nd Pennsylvania. I mean, they, they, both armies had, had people from, their own, from the same town fighting with each other. So that was a very powerful lure on both sides. You really were, you hear often brother against brother in the Civil War, and, and, and that's true. But you were also fighting with your friends. The, everybody in, you know, now that wouldn't happen. You fight with people from the United States, but not necessarily from, from your hometown. It, it, I grew up in Bellevue. If I was in the Civil War, I would have been fighting with people from getting from Bellevue. You know, my friends and and I knew their parents. And it just it adds when you think of that, take it down to the personal level, it adds a different dynamic. So that's what happened to these guys, at least four of them. They were they were they were friendly. They were in this unit for five years, having no idea war was gonna break out, and then it broke out and and everybody went and enlisted. Well, that's one of the things about militia units. People, like you said, have a different perception of that word now. But if I had to compare it to anything today that people could relate to, it might be, let's say, your local volunteer fire department, where you, people join the volunteer fire department for on any number of reasons. Uh, they hang out at the firehouse. When there's not a fire, they have all these activities. Like you said, it's a social activity. It's unpaid. And it's a community activity. And there's pride. Every, any fireman I know, there's great pride that they're part of, of that unit. I, I never thought of that, but that's, that's actually very similar. It's, it's the same kind of concept as why you join. You're doing something for your town. Mm -hmm. you're, you're defending in a different way. That was a little more military back then because we're not all that far from the revolution, you know, when, when you, you needed Towns to have militia units. Yeah, there wasn't, a, you know, for early United States, there, wasn't, there weren't standing armies. Militia units were what you had. So it was much more part of part of the mainstream but you're right I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna steal that from you and use that something the fire department now is very similar to that attitude it, it, that's what that reminds me of because a militia unit was there to protect your town from anything not just uh, it wasn't to be part of a civil war or right. an effort to secede right. so these guys were part of a militia unit in their town and this goes for the north too 
because all these units then they fought together side by side and so they and there's something you hear in war even today and that is am I fighting for my country and almost every soldier who's fought in battle says I was fighting for my brother or my sister somebody who was in my unit that's who I'm really fighting for because they have my back I have theirs well this adds that dimension because not only are you fighting alongside your fellow soldier but this fellow soldier is from your hometown that you knew it, it, Absolutely. And, and the other thing, sometimes you'll take, you know, because warfare, obviously, because of weaponry has changed. You know, when I took my stepson up to, to Gettysburg, it was like, why would they march across that field? He, he, he couldn't fathom it. You know, the, the, there was far less powerful weaponry, so you had to do that. But you think all the time, could I have done that? No way. I would have run. Or You know, a lot of people say it. But one of the reasons you didn't is because you would have been shamed forever back in your hometown. If you're, if you're with guys from Wyoming and Louisiana and Wisconsin, they're not going to know when you go back to your hometown. But if you're with 10 guys, 20 guys from your hometown, your name is stained forever. So you read these accounts, and, and that kind of drove those. They all had to go together. They did it together as a brotherhood. But also, you didn't want your reputation to be sullied by, well, yeah, but he wouldn't. You know, we went forward, but he wouldn't go forward with us. He was a coward. Well, what, what, how did it turn out for the Hoffman brothers? They went to the battle in Gettysburg. Do you know where they fought? Do you know if they saw their family? And how did it turn out for them after the war? From what their immediate family all had moved to the south. So they didn't have, to the extent that I could find, they didn't have any relatives in Gettysburg. So they didn't have that experience. One was in the infantry, one was in the artillery, and one was in the cavalry. So the infantryman, Robert Hoffman, must not have been a very good infantryman. He was, uh, he was uh, in the commissary department by that time they got there. He was driving cattle. It says that on his... Uh, on his uh, service records, because you need, you know, I, you, you kind of laugh at that, but you think they had to feed all these guys. So that was, a, that was an important part of it. But even more so, it made him in a way expendable to have been a scout or guide. He, they weren't giving up a gun from the ranks. He could have easily done that. He was 16 when he moved from Gettysburg. So he, he had a real knowledge of the town. Frank Hoffman was in the, the artillery. He was actually in part of the bombardment for Pickett's Charge. He was posted not far from Henry Wentz. And Wesley Hoffman was in the cavalry. They were on the, his unit was on the fringes. They fought a battle in, in Fairfield about eight miles away on July 3rd. But they were all in the campaign. They, you know, obviously, everybody who came north didn't fight in the battle per se. So one of the Hoffmans fought actually in the battle, but the other two were in the vicinity. And therefore, w- could have really been effective as, as scouts or guides if anybody if anybody had known. How did things turn out for the three brothers after the war? You know, Wesley Culp was, was killed in Gettysburg, so obviously uh, that ended for him. Henry Wentz went back to Martinsburg, lived not long after the war, 10 or 12 years. The Hoffmans all went back to the South, had uh, differing levels of success. Uh, and the one, one thing that struck me was Frank Hoffman uh, moved eventually to Washington, D.C., and I, when I was looking up uh, some information on him and his obituaries, and some of these guys did have published obituaries, which gave you – when he was – some people have asked me, was this story not known because these guys hid their background, that they didn't say where they were from? Absolutely not. Henry Wentz's uh, uh, obituary said he was a proud Confederate whose, whose father owned land on the Gettysburg battlefield. And Frank Hoffman's obituary said he identified him as a PA man who fought for the Confederacy. So they, they knew, their friends knew, their families knew their stories. But what hit me was he had a daughter who lived until 1972. That's only 47 years ago that so somebody was alive who knew closely one of these guys. I mean, you really think. She was in her 90s, obviously, but that's how – sometimes you forget that's how close we were. It almost seems sometimes like it's ancient times. There's been so many, so many wars since then. It seems so long ago, but there are people – it's not that far along that people would have been able to talk to these guys. How I wish she had written something down, but like, you know, I, I think these families were – you know, we're used to the letters from the very – verbiose and loquacious people who wrote all the time. But everybody wasn't like that. Everybody didn't write letters. Most didn't. And if they did, most of them haven't survived. So maybe she did write something and we just haven't survived. I I did find a a family history that Robert Hoffman's daughter wrote, uh, never published, 
the internet's an amazing thing. I stumbled across it. It was a, it was, there was one copy of it at a library in Dallas, and I happened to be taking a business trip to Dallas, so I found it, and it was a great foundation for research on that family. Again, these guys didn't talk a lot about their time in Gettysburg, but I found a lot about their lives, and that was kind of the purpose of of the book, too, about the lives, what you know, people in the 19th century who, who did this sort of thing. Well, there were some people that weren't in your book that I wanted to talk about today, just to round things out a little bit, because those were five hometown Gettysburg boys who came back and fought for the Confederacy. There were some other people, and this helps illustrate the battle and its effect on people. Jenny Wade was the only civilian. She was killed in the battle. She lived on a street called Breckenridge Street in Gettysburg, and she and her mother were seamstresses. Because of the battle coming to Gettysburg, she actually moved to another house. She wasn't actually in her house when this happened. Her, her sister actually had given birth, so she was in her sister's house. And she was making bread for the troops. And it sounds like what happened was, while she was making bread for the Union troops, a mini ball came through the door and hit her in the upper back and it pierced, it must have gone through her upper back because it pierced her heart and she died. So, uh, so some Union soldiers took her to the basement and I believe when the battle was over, they buried her. Unbeknownst to Jenny, she had a boyfriend who was fighting for the Union Army. His name was Jack Skelly and he was fighting in another battle not too far away. And he was mortally wounded, and he would die a few days later. So Jenny died during the Battle of Gettysburg, and Jack Skelly died a few days later. And they were both sort of, I don't know if they were actually engaged, but she was considered his betrothed. thats Do you know anything more about yeah, Jenny it Wade's was, story? Uh, it's actually part of this book because Wesley Culp and Jenny Wade and Jack Skelly were friends. Um, Wesley Culp had fought against Jack Skelly at Winchester just a few weeks earlier. Uh, as well against, as against his brother, William. And Jack Skelly had been wounded seriously in that battle. As the prisoners were, Union prisoners were walking through town, Wes, Wesley Culp saw them and found that his friend Jack Skelly was wounded. He actually went and found him along the edge of a woods and got him taken to a hospital. And they had a conversation. And there was talk that he, Jack Skelly gave him a message. We don't know whether it was for his mother or Jenny Wade. They're, they're both, we, we can't ever uh, figure that out. But he gave him a message. So Wesley Culp had a message from Jack Skelly that he was supposed to deliver in Gettysburg. And he told his sisters the night he was at his house, because they lived across the street from Mrs. Skelly by Cork of Fate. You could not make this stuff up. I'll be back tomorrow, and I have a message from Mrs. Skelly. And then he got killed, so he, so he didn't. So, you know, it's such a small town. These guys were all about the same age. So they were all friends and friendly. And Jenny Wade's dad had worked for Jack Skelly's dad, and they knew, they knew Wesley Culp's dad. Again, really, you know, a couple thousand people in town, that's all. So really small town. So that's very much a part of it. And so you can add Wesley Culp to that story. All three of these people within a week and a half died not knowing what had happened to the other. Wesley Culp never would have known that Jack died because he, he survived for a few days. You know, and I, and I think it's, it's important, Tim, to get to when we talk about war, we, I'm guilty of this too, you can get so much into the military tactics. I love military history. One of the reasons I'm so interested in Gettysburg, I love the tactics, who was where, who made the decision. But you've got to remember to get to the personal level. And when you get it to that personal, these three young people within it, you know, uh, one fought for the Union, one fought for the Confederacy. Jenny obviously was 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 pro-Union. They all they all lost their lives. You know, how many people lost their lives during the Civil War? How the country would have been different if we, just if we didn't have the war, just because of the humanity that would have still been here. The number of people who lost their, you know, six hundred thousand people at least. The movie that you mentioned uh, about Gettysburg was based on a book called Killer Angels that I remember reading myself. It's the reason that I became so interested in Gettysburg. I'm going to mention a couple of characters, but I'm going to ask you a question about one of them. Union General John Buford was the cavalry commander, and he was there on day one. He was the one that everyone credits for looking around the town and seeing these hills and saying, look, if we can control these hills, we can win any kind of battle that might happen here. Not that he could foresee how big Gettysburg as a battle was going to be, but he could foresee 
what it could be. So he's the one who said we have to pick out these hills and find a position. So he's credited with that. And there's a, and if you ever read that book, uh, Killer Angels, I would say that it's worth it just to read what was going through his mind. Because even though it was a military tactic, you're also inside the mind of a person who's charged with defending his country. And it's at that critical time where if he doesn't make some decisions on his own, as you said, the whole history of the country could have changed. Then there is another general, and he's on the other side, Confederate General James Longstreet, and he's another one. He went to West Point with some of the Union generals. He was West Point trained just like General Lee, and he just, like everybody on the, on the Confederate side, he loved Robert E. Lee, and he would not want anything uh, to come between him and his general. But at Gettysburg, he had some, I guess he had some questions about the strategy, he didn't think that any army was going to do well charging uphill. So he tried to counsel his, his senior general, Robert E. Lee, to pick better ground for fighting, fight another day. Robert E. Lee took the position that this is the ground, this is where we are, we're going to fight right here. So after the war, Longstreet kind of spent some time explaining his thinking during that battle and during other battles during the Civil War. He became a very successful person in the in the fully restored United States after that. Can you talk a little bit about James Longstreet's yeah, story? He was a Buford that fascinated me too. Buford's uh, reputation, by the way, was resuscitated by the, the book and the movie because he had kind of been lost to history. He's now viewed as one of the great union figures at the battle. I think a lot of things wrote, written in the first hundred years, you started to lose John Buford's importance. So the, that book and the movie could only focus on a number of people, but it, it, it really did resuscitate the reputations of a couple of them. It obviously focused on, on on Long Street. The one thing about that is um, when, when you look at history, I found this in my Flight 93 book too, even though it's contemporary history. I think we have to look at the most valuable and likely the most correct information is the information that's written during or right after the battle. Because what happens as time goes on, it's human nature. People hear how they're being judged, and all of a sudden their memory changes. And you, you see that if you read accounts as time goes on. There's people kind of changing their story a little bit to respond to criticism so they don't look bad or they, or they look better. The one thing happened with the, with, that happened with the Lee-Longstreet dispute was that Lee died not long after the Civil War, never wrote his memoirs, was pretty tight-lipped about it, I think out of respect in those, in those eight or ten years that he lived. After Lee died, Longstreet was – was being blamed by a lot of people in the South for what happened at Gettysburg and therefore in the Civil War because he had opposed some of Robert Lee's strategy. And he started writing to defend himself, as you naturally would. So I think what happens in that account, who, it, what Longstreet wrote, all of that might be true. We just don't know. We just it, It's the difficulty of it. We don't have Lee's perspective. We have lots of Longstreet's perspective. And he was being attacked by people. So that's certainly the, the take that, that Michael Shara, who wrote Killer Angels, was, was a historic novel but was based on, on what actually happened the battle took. But I, I think those are things, though, that's why those of us who study it, study it. Because you try to get that one more clue that lets you understand it. We're not going to know. If you could ever know, then we would, we would reach our conclusions and we would go on to something else. I mean, why I will, until the day I die, be studying the Civil War is, is because I can't know. And I'm trying to – every time I go up there, I try to find one more thing. And, and occasionally you'll read a document and say, oh, that gives me a little different perspective. Who wrote that? When did they write it? Because it's a lot more valuable if, if it was the Civil War, 1861 to 65, if they wrote it in the 1860s as opposed to what they wrote in the 1890s, much less the – as you and I know, getting older, your, your memory starts to fade a little bit. But the way you look at things is sometimes through the prism of how you are being judged in history. And everybody wants to be judged well in history. So I think some of that happened with, with the Longstreet story. One other person was Joshua Chamberlain because he's another one who, he was from the Union, he was from the state of Maine, he was a college professor before the war, he was a romantic, he wanted to go off and do something very romantic like fight 
in an army and be a hero. Well, unbeknownst to him, he would become a hero, but not in the way he probably envisioned it. He was the uh, commander of a group, uh, the main 20th. They were posted on the one flank of the Union Army on a hill that they didn't expect to be attacked. They, they called it Little Round Top. There was a, another hill called Big Round Top. And, but Little Round Top is where he was. Well, as it turned out, they were attacked by the Confederates. His small group ran out of ammunition. They knew that the Southerners, uh, the Confederate forces, were going to be charging up the hill. And he just creatively came up with this idea. He said, let's put the bayonets on our weapons. Let's line up so that one part of our, our force doesn't charge straight back down the hill, but sort of closes like a door on the charging forces. So we have a, the, the group that the forces are facing, and then coming from their right side, our left side, this group will swing in and with almost no artillery, no ammunition, charge these people and they will think they're surrounded. And that's exactly what happened. They thought they were surrounded. Uh, they retreated. And with almost no ammunition, Chamberlain's group won that battle and, and saved the flank and maybe saved the whole Gettysburg battle. But here's the thing that you were just saying. Chamberlain is a very literate guy and he lived a long life and he had a lot of time to tell his story after the war. So history is sometimes told by those who survive, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, you often hear it's told by the victors, but it's also told by the survivors. You know, and that's what told me. There were many heroic deeds done for the Union Army that those three days, but those men either died at Gettysburg or died in a battle a year later and never got to tell their story. Joshua Chamberlain went on to become the four-term governor of Maine and the president of college and, and, and one of the most famous men in the, in, in the country. So, yes, uh, he was able to tell his story. He deserved it, but, but again, even with that— uh, until that, until Killer Angels in the movie, he had faded. There's a, there's a book, uh, the Gettysburg Campaign by Eben Coddington. It was for 50 years the single standard for study of the Battle of Gettysburg uh, that the guides had to study. As we learned, Chamberlain is mentioned on five pages of a 500 page book. Now, if you go to Gettysburg, he is one. Of the, people want to go to Little Round Top and see where Joshua Chamberlain fought. He is one of the most famous, maybe the most famous uh, figure from the Union Army. To, to modern day visitors because of Killer Angels and, and the movie Gettysburg. And again, it's great, but you, you, would you write a book on Chamberlain? Yes, but there have been about 50 books on Chamberlain. That's what I'm talking. You know, a lot of these great stories have been written so much. That's why I tried to find just kind of one little angle that maybe hadn't been written. You did. And I, I think today then we had the chance then to talk about some of those privates and a sergeant, uh, the only civilian who was killed in the battle, and then a couple of the key decision makers or, or officers that were in the war. But I think that all leads us to a question that you and I had talked about previous to this, and that was, if the North doesn't win, you said we could have five countries, and I'd really like to hear your thoughts on that. What happens if the North doesn't win? Yeah, the, the, the five-country thing wasn't an original thought by me. I've read that, but it's, it's stuck with me because I think when you think of – when you go back in history, it's, you have to think, what if th wherever you are, what if things had turned out differently here? Lee, Robert E. Lee's idea was to come, he knew he couldn't conquer the Union Army. His idea was to come north, defeat the Union Army on Union soil, and get that peace movement in the, New York, in, in the north, which was starting to form already. People say, why do we keep fighting these guys? Let them go have their own country. Why are we having our young men die? And Lee thought if he could get a great victory, beat the Union Army on northern soil, that's what would happen. That we don't know. That very well may have happened had the Confederates won the Battle of Gettysburg, or won if they moved from Gettysburg, won somewhere else in, in, in Pennsylvania. And one of the theories that I had read was well, you certainly would then have North and South. You would have those two countries, but the West wasn't even. We were just about to Kansas. You know, we the rest wasn't even formed yet. Um, neither country, as as I read this theory, would have been strong enough to control the West. So you at least have probably three countries. And then California and Texas might become countries of their own. I mean, Texas was a republic up until 1845. So you just think, and, and there was always a thought, you know, what John Adams and some of those guys were fighting against in the late, late 1700s was so the, the United States, the colonies, 
didn't start to replicate Europe, which is a great landmass with 30 different countries there, 30 different little states. People once thought that would happen to the United States. That's what the founding fathers tried to fight against, to make it all one. But here was a situation where uh, it wouldn't have been to that level, but there would have been no government entity strong enough to rule the whole continent or the whole continental United States. Imagine that that impact on the history of the world. If the United States wasn't able to, to be the United States that it, you know, that it was in the, in, in the, the 20th century, the American century. So you think it's a what if, who knows, you can never know for sure. It's just kind of fun to think about that. And when I walk those fields, I think about, and, and you know, that's where when you, uh, when you give credit and praise to the Union Army for what those guys did who were just, again, we talk about the commanders, but the soldiers were just regular guys. They were farmers and blacksmiths and ministers, my ancestors, who, who went there and fought for four years and then went back to their regular jobs. But they, uh, they preserved the country and, uh, and uh, allowed the future to happen as it unfolded. Well, that's another point you make when you talk about Europe and all those smaller countries as part of the larger continent and what could have happened here. But again, what people may not realize if they look at things through the year, uh, through the prism of 2019 is back in 1863, states were like many countries. People don't realize that states were their own sovereign entities within. That's why we were called the United States, because there was a certain... Um, differentiation between states that existed then that doesn't exist now. Right. And, and some of that was just transportation. Most people never traveled more than 50 miles from where they were born. Now we can, you know, you can get to California in four hours. So just think of that perspective. People from Georgia had never been to Maine. People from Pennsylvania had never been to Florida. So, you know, there, there's, there's that part of it too. But yes, uh, as they began, as the colonies began, they were, they were their own entities. And one of the striking statements is that before the Civil War, the phrase was, the sentence was, the United States are... After the Civil War, it was the United States is. The United States became a noun. It wasn't just a collection of, it wasn't a, a plural. It became singular. Even though the word is plural, it became a singular noun, the United States. We don't think of it now, but before that, they were viewed as those parts. And, and, and frankly, that was part, you know, there, there's no question slavery was the cause of the Civil War. It was, it was the most important factor. States' rights were part of that, though. The southern states thought that they, their, each state should, should be sovereign and, and make its own rules and make its own decisions. That was the secondary part of this. Now, the most important slave states' right was slavery, but, but that, was, that was part of it. So, I mean, the country changed in so many ways, but I think that the United States are, the United States is, was a really impactful thing that I think people nowadays don't, don't think about. In effect, the whole war was fought to change that whole mindset, that we are one country. And at least that, that was the view of the Union by its very name. Right after the battle, Gettysburg was well known. It was well covered in the media. There were photographs. In November, President Lincoln would come to Gettysburg to give his famous Gettysburg Address. And he gave that at the dedication of a cemetery. And we all know the story, or many of us know the story of, of that address, that that Lincoln wasn't the primary speaker that day, but in fact, a lot of people didn't really hear him speak that day, but when a transcript of his speech was reprinted in newspapers, that's where it gained traction. But I guess my question for you here is more about the, 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 the public mood after Gettysburg. Why did that particular battle capture the country's attention? Why did that battle, more than any other battle, capture the North's attention? The North was so much larger than the South population-wise, about four to one. So just more people were were involved and interested in, in that fate, and the, the Union Army had not been doing well through the first two years of the war. I'm sure it was very terrifying. The Union Army kept losing battles and losing battles, and win one here, but losing battles. Now here comes this Confederate menace. Again, you're only reading about this in newspapers. You're not watching it on CNN every night. There aren't interviews, as so myths and legends get created. Into the north, into Pennsylvania. Imagine the terror and fear that that would have caused. And that was one of Lee's ideas. The whole, a lot of the war had been fought in Virginia. He, and they knew that it was 
Well, it, yes, it was heroic, but it was also very gory and, and costly and damaging. And he thought the Union, uh, the people in the North didn't know that. So part of it was to bring the horror of war to the North and, and, and shock them with that. Had the Confederates won, I think there would have been a large panic. But I think because the Union finally got a big victory, beat Robert E. Lee, defended Union soil, defended Pennsylvania soil. I think that was it, and that was a, a turning point. And maybe it's looked in history as you know, we, we like to tell night, these neat little stories. Gettysburg called the turning point of the war. The war went on for two more years. The Confederates won more battles after that. Things could have changed. But looking back now, we realize that there really wasn't much of a chance for the Confederacy. A lot, a lot of lives were lost, needlessly, after Gettysburg. The Gettysburg and, and, and Vicksburg the next day in Mississippi, where uh, Ulysses S. Grant won that victory. So that, that double prong, July 3rd, July 4th, 1863, really, really changed it. But I think that was it. It was on Union soil. It was on Northern soil. And again, because the Union veterans were so proud, it was not long after that, before the end of the war, they started saying, we have to start memorializing this battlefield. Let's buy up the land. Let's start collecting for monuments. And it wasn't, you know, in, in the late 19th century, most of those monuments were put up. These guys were very proud. And because of that, we have what it is, what it is today. Are there as many in the South? No. Why? They didn't win, and they didn't have the money. But here, the, the Union Army, those guys could choose, could focus on one battlefield, that one battlefield in the north where we're going we're gonna to have our biggest and best and most attractive monument right here because we, we know people are going to come to visit it. We want them to see where we fought. And that's why they have those monuments. Those guys were – it was the, – the individual regiments paid for them themselves. The state monuments were paid by the states. The regiments were paid by the soldiers. They raised that money. So they were very proud of it, justifiably so. And, and many continued to go back – visit until pretty much the 75th anniversary, the last big reunion where uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt spoke, uh, spoke in Gettysburg. When you talk about the, them going back and, and funding these monuments, if you go through Gettysburg, there are monuments to Confederate troops and in and, and places where these troops were positioned. One of the things that always surprised me was when you would see pictures or films or, or articles or even books written about the reunions, and you would have these former Union troops next to former Confederate troops marking the same reunion. And, and I, it looked to me like it was a collegial way. It didn't look to me, it, it didn't look to me like these were arch enemies by this point in time. These, but you're also talking about the 1920s, you know, when they were still having reunions and, and there were still enough people who fought in the battle to be in larger groups. What do you know about the animosity between the enemies and when that might have started to fade? You can only guess uh, because a little bit's written, been written about it. Most guys wouldn't have written about that, and who knows if what they wrote was was true. I, I, my, just to looking at it and seeing what happened and seeing what's happened in wars since then, I think as time goes on, there's a shared respect of a fellow warrior, whether that's U.S. and the Japanese from Pearl Harbor where you see some reunions, and the U.S. and the Vietnamese, where you see some reunions in the great Ken Burns piece, where they were, you know, where they were talking. Not everybody. Some people never, never lose it. My dad fought in World War II. He he had feelings about that till till the day he died. So it's not everybody, but I th I think that's what it was. And there, you know, there's an iconic picture on the 50th anniversary of uh, survivors of Pickett's Charge, North and South, going to that stone wall and shaking hands over the wall. Now, there, you know, there were negotiations with that, and everybody didn't go, and some of the Union soldiers didn't like it. But I, th I think as time went on, that happened. And I only um, – I was not in the military, so I can only guess, but what that shared experience might have been. I know in my life, when I've had shared experiences with someone, never that dramatic, but I feel closer to them. And you connect years later, and you do it. I think that's what it is. And, and again, you see it. With the Vietnamese, the Vietnam War, you see it with World War II. You see a little bit of that. I think there, there's that, you know, sharing of, of of those stories. So yes, those, you know, those things happened, and and uh, it it is rather it's 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 an amazing look at the human psyche as to what we think of that were you know your your 
really trying to kill each other at one point, and then maybe 25 years later, you're shaking hands over over the place where you fought in and talking to people about uh, about fighting against each other. When I look at those same stories you talk about with people who were uh, who are alive today, it seems to me that without getting into psychology, really. For the people who were participants in these battles, it was closure. You could, you could, well, I think you know many of them went back to the fields too. Many of them went back and visited, you know, where where they fought, and, and they they picked up souvenirs and they collected those things. And they were they were just they were very proud of their service. The Union Army, I know, I some ancestors were in the Civil War. You can just see, and the, and they were, nobody was famous, nobody was particularly heroic, other than anybody who fights in a war is heroic. Do any didn't you know win any medals of honor or anything? Just regular foot soldiers, but very proud of of what they did and stayed in those unions. You know, the GAR, the Grand Army, the Republic. They they were very proud to march in parades and 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 show what they had done. It was it was for many of them, I think, in the Union Army, the the singular defining moment of their lives. As I'm sure the World War II generation would have said the same thing. Those guys said the defining moment of my life was fighting in World War II. It was for my father. I know that. So. I, it's, 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 that doesn't change over eras. Tom McMillan, thank you for joining us today. Tim, it's been my, my pleasure. To learn more about Tom McMillan's several history books and about the Battle of Gettysburg, please see our show notes at shapingopinion.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please let people know by leaving a rating and review in Apple Podcasts. You can subscribe to the Shaping Opinion Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcasts. We'd love to hear from you. On Twitter, just tweet to us at Shaping Opinion. Or you can get in touch with us through our website, shapingopinion.com. We have a Facebook group that you can join and a Facebook page you can follow. And we're on Instagram at Shaping Opinion. Shaping Opinion is a production of O'Brien Communications. This is where we talk about people, events, and things that have shaped the way we think. Until next time, I'm Tim O'Brien. Music